A Patriot's History of the United States. Chapter 1, Part 2. Whether Columbus had found parts of the Far East or an entirely new land was irrelevant to most Europeans at the time. Political distractions abounded in Europe. Spain had barely evicted the Muslims after the long Reconquista, and England's War of the Roses had scarcely ended. News of Columbus's discoveries excited only a few merchants, explorers, and dreamers. Still, the prospect of finding a waterway to Asia infatuated sailors, and in 1501, a Florentine passenger on a Portuguese voyage, Amerigo Vespucci, wrote letters to his friends in which he described the New World. His self-promoting dispatches circulated sooner than Columbus's own written accounts, and as a result, the term America soon was attached by the geographers to the continents in the Western Hemisphere that should by right have been named Columbia. But if Columbus did not receive the honor of having the New World name for him, and if he acquired only temporary wealth and fame in Spain, receiving from the crown the title Admiral of the Ocean Sea, his place in history was never in doubt. Historian Samuel Eliot Morrison, a worthy seaman in his own right, who reenacted the Columbian voyages in 1939 and 1940, described Columbus as the sign and symbol of the new age of hope, glory, and accomplishment. Once Columbus brazed the trail, other Spanish explorers had less trouble obtaining financial backing for expeditions. Vasco Núñez de Balboa, 1513, crossed the Isthmus of Panama to the Pacific Ocean, as he named it. Ferdinand Magellan, 1519-1522, circumnavigated the globe lending his name to the Straits of Magellan. Other expeditions explored the interior of the newly discovered lands. Juan Ponce de Leon, traversing an area along Florida's coast, attempted unsuccessfully to plant a colony there. Panfilo de Navies' subsequent expedition to conquer Tampa Bay proved even more disastrous. Navarez himself drowned, and natives killed members of his expedition until only four of them reached a Spanish settlement in Mexico. Spaniards traversed modern-day Mexico, probing interior areas under Hernando Cortez, who, in 1518, led a force of 1,000 soldiers to Tenochtitlan, the site of present-day Mexico City. Cortez encountered powerful Indians called Aztecs, led by their emperor, Montezuma. The Aztecs had established a brutal regime that oppressed other natives of the region, capturing large numbers of them for ritual sacrifices in which Aztec priests cut out the beating hearts of living victims. Such barbarity enabled the Spanish to easily enlist other tribes, especially the Tlaxcalans, in their efforts to defeat the Aztecs. Tenochtitlan sat on an island in the middle of a lake, connected to the outlying areas by three huge causeways. It was a monstrously large city for the time, of at least 200,000, rigidly divided into nobles and commoner groups. Aztec culture created impressive pyramid-shaped temple structures, but Aztec science lacked the simple wheel and the wide range of pulleys and gears that it enabled. But it was sacrifice, not science, that defined Aztec society whose pyramids, after all, were execution sites. A four-day sacrifice in 1487 by the Aztec king Ahultzatl involved the butchery of 80,400 prisoners by shifts of priests working four at a time at convex killing tables who kicked lifeless, heartless bodies down the side of the pyramid temple. This worked out to a killing rate of 14 victims a minute over the 96-hour bloodbath. In addition to the abominable sacrifice system, crime and street carnage were commonplace. More intriguing to the Spanish than the buildings, or even the sacrifices, however, were the legends of gold, silver, and other riches Tenochtitlan contained, protected by the powerful Aztec army. Cortes first attempted a direct assault on the city and fell back with heavy losses, narrowly escaping extermination. 
Desperate Spanish fought their way out on Noche Treste, the sad night, when hundreds of them fell on the causeway. Cortez's men piled human bodies, Aztec and European alike, in heaps to block Aztec pursuers, then staggered back to Veracruz. In 1521, Cortez returned with a new Spanish army, supported by more than 25,000 Indian allies. This time he found a weakened enemy who had been ravaged by smallpox, or, as the Aztecs called it, the Great Leprosy. Starvation killed those Aztecs whom the disease did not. They died in heaps like bedbugs, wrote one historian. Even so, neither disease nor starvation accounted for the Spaniards' stunning victory over the vastly larger Aztec forces, which can be credited to the Spanish use of European-style disciplined shock combat and the employment of modern firepower. Severing the causeways, stationing huge units to guard each, Cortez assaulted the city walls from 13 brigantines, the Spaniards had hauled overland, sealing off the city. These brigantines proved far more ingeniously engineered for fighting on the Aztec native waters than any boat constructed in Mexico during the entire history of its civilization. When it came to the final battle, it was not the brigantines, but Cortez's use of cannons, muskets, harquebuses, crossbows, and pikes in deadly discipline, firing in order, and standing as a unit against a murderous mass of Aztecs who fought as individuals rather than a cohesive force that proved decisive. Spanish technology, including the wheel-related ratchet gears on muskets, constituted only one element of European military superiority. They fought as other European land armies fought, in formation, with their officers open to new ideas based on practicality, not theology. Where no Aztec would dare approach the godlike Montezuma with a military strategy, Cortez debated tactics with his lieutenants routinely, and the European way of war endowed each Castilian soldier with a sense of individual rights, civic duty, and personal freedom non-existent in the Aztec kingdom. Moreover, the Europeans sought to kill their enemies and force his permanent surrender, not forge an arrangement for a steady supply of sacrifice victims. Thus, Cortez captured the Aztec capital in 1521 at a cost of more than 100,000 dead Aztecs, many from disease resulting from Cortez's cutting the city's water supply. But not all diseases came from the old world to the new, and syphilis appeared to have been retransmitted back from Brazil to Portugal. If Europeans resembled other cultures in their attitude toward conquest, they differed substantially in their practice and effectiveness. The Spanish especially proved adept at defeating native peoples for three reasons. First, they were mobile. Horses and ships endowed the Spanish with vast advantages in mobility over the natives. Second, the burgeoning economic power of Europe enabled quantum leaps over Middle Eastern, Asian, and Mesoamerican cultures. This economic wealth made possible the shipping and equipping of large, trained, well-armed forces. Non-military technological advances such as the iron tip plow, the windmill, and the water wheel all had spread through Europe and allowed monarchs to employ fewer resources in the farming sector and more in science, engineering, writing, and the military. A natural outgrowth of this economic wealth was improved military technology including guns, which made any single Spanish soldier the equal of several poorly armed natives, offsetting the latter's numerical advantage. But these two factors were magnified by a third element, the glue that held it all together, which was a Western way of combat that emphasized group cohesion of free citizens. Like the ancient Greeks and Romans, Cortez's Castilians fought from a long tradition of tactical adaptation based on individual freedom, civic rights, and a preference for shock battle of heavy infantry that grew out of consensual government, equality among the middling classes, and other distinctly Western traits that gave numerically inferior European armies a decisive edge. That made it possible for tiny expeditions such as Ponce de Leon's with only 200 men and 50 horses or Narvezas with a force of 600, including cooks, colonists, and women, 
to overcome native Mexican armies, outnumbering them two, three, and even 10 times at any particular time. More to the point, no native culture could have conceived of maintaining expeditions of thousands of men in the field for months at a time. Virtually all the natives lived off the land and took slaves back to their home, as opposed to colonizing new territory with their own settlers. Indeed, only the European industrial engine could have provided the material wherewithal to maintain such armies, and only the European political constructs of liberty, property rights, and nationalism kept men in combat for abstract political causes. European combat style produced yet another advantage in that firearms showed no favoritism in the battlefield. Spanish gunfire destroyed the hierarchy of the enemy, including the aristocratic dominant political class. Aztec chiefs and more sultans alike were completely vulnerable to massed firepower. Yet without the legal framework of republicanism and civic virtue like Europe's to replace its leadership cadre, a native army could be decapitated at the head with one volley, whereas the Spanish forces could see lieutenants fall and seamlessly replace them with sergeants. Did Columbus kill most of the Indians? The 500-year anniversary of Columbus's discovery was marked by unusual and strident controversy. Rising up to challenge the intrepid voyager's courage and vision, as well as the establishment of European civilization in the New World, was a crescendo of damnation which posited that the Genoese navigator was a mass murderer akin to Adolf Hitler. Even the establishment of European outposts was, according to the revisionist critique, a regrettable development. Although this division of interpretations no doubt confused and dampened many a Colombian festival in 1992, it also elicited a most intriguing historical debate. Did the esteemed Admiral of the Ocean Sea kill almost all the Indians? A number of recent scholarly studies have dispelled or at least substantially modified many of the numbers generated by the anti-Columbus groups although other new research has actually increased them. Why the sharp inconsistencies? One recent scholar examining the major assessments of numbers points to at least nine different measurement methods, including the time-worn favorite guesstimates. Consider the weakness in some of the Columbian holocaust arguments. One, pre-Columbian native population numbers were much smaller than critics have maintained. For example, one author claims approximately 56 million people died as a result of European exploration in the New World. For that to have occurred, however, one must start with early estimates for the population of the Western Hemisphere at nearly 100 million. Recent research suggests that the number is vastly inflated and that the most reliable figure is near to 53 million, and even that estimate falls with each new publication. Since 1976 alone, experts have lowered their estimates by 4 million. Some scholars have even seen these figures as wildly inflated, and several studies put the native population of North America alone within a range of 8.5 million, at the highest, to a low estimate of 1.8 million. If the latter number is true, it means that the Holocaust or depopulation that occurred was one fiftieth of the original estimates, or 800,000 Indians who died from disease and firearms. Although that number is a universe away from the estimates of 50 to 60 million deaths that some researchers have trumpeted, it still represents a destruction of half the native population. Even then, the guesstimates involve such things as accounting for the effects of epidemics, which other researchers, using the same data, dispute ever occurred or expanding the sample area to all of North and Central America. However, estimating the number of people alive in a region 500 years ago has proven difficult, and recently several researchers have called into question most early estimates. For example, one method many scholars have used to arrive at population numbers, extrapolating from early explorers' estimates of the populations they could count, has been challenged by archaeological studies of the Amazon basin where dense settlements were once thought to exist. 
Work in the area by Betty Meggers concludes the early explorer's estimates were exaggerated and that no evidence of large population in that region exists. Indy Cook's demographic research on the Inca in Peru showed that the population could have been as high as 15 million or as low as 4 million, suggesting that the measurement mechanism have a plus or minus reliability factor of 400%. Such minor exaggerations as the tendency of some explorers to overestimate their opponents' numbers, which when factored throughout the numerous village, then into an entire population, had led to overestimates of millions. Two, native populations had epidemics long before Europeans arrived. A recent study of more than 12,500 skeletons from 65 sites found that native health was on a downward trajectory long before Columbus arrived. Some suggest that Indians may have had a non-venereal form of syphilis, and almost all agree that a variety of infections were widespread. Tuberculosis existed in Central and North America long before the Spanish appeared, as did herpes, polio, tick-borne fevers, giardiasis, and amoebic dysentery. One admittedly controversial study by Henry Dobbins in Current Anthropology in 1966, later fleshed out over the years into his book, argued that extensive epidemics swept North America before Europeans arrived. As one authority summed up the research, though the old world was to contribute to its diseases, the new world certainly was not the Garden of Eden some have depicted. As one might expect, others challenged Dobbins and the early epidemic school, but the point remains that experts are divided. Many now discount the notion that huge epidemics swept through Central and North America. Smallpox, in particular, did not seem to spread as a pandemic. Three, there is little evidence available for estimating the number of people lost in warfare prior to the Europeans because, in general, natives did not keep written records. Later, when whites could document oral histories during the Indian Wars on the western frontiers, they found that different tribes exaggerated their accounts of battle in totally different ways, depending on tribal custom. Some who preferred to emphasize bravery over brains inflated casualty numbers. Others viewing large body counts as a sign of weakness de-emphasized their losses. What is certain is that vast numbers of natives were killed by other natives and that only technological backwardness, the absence of gun, for example, prevented the numbers of natives killed by other natives from growing even higher. Four, large areas of Mexico and the Southwest were depopulated more than 100 years before the arrival of Columbus. According to a recent source, the majority of the Southwesterners believe that many areas of the greater Southwest were abandoned or largely depopulated over a century before Columbus's fateful discovery as a result of climatic shifts warfare, resource mismanagement, and other causes. Indeed, a new generation of scholars puts more credence in early Spanish explorers' observation of widespread ruins and decaying great houses that they contended had been abandoned for years. And five, European scholars have long appreciated the dynamic of small state diplomacy, such as was involved in the Italian or German small states in the 19th century. What has been missing from the discussion about native populations has been a recognition that, in many ways, the tribes resembled the small states in Europe. They concerned themselves more with traditional enemies, other tribes, than with new ones, the whites. And here's a list of sources. And we'll continue with our reading in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. If this is of any value to you, please reach down, click like, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment below. Love to hear from you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. I love you guys.